Welcome to the Steve and Samino Says Boom Show issue number 51. What about it, Steve? Oh. Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. been having a lot of special guests and now we're at issue 51 my god steve we got more guests coming and now with the pop xp with billy tucci in in uh in the ether up there what do we need to know what do we need to do well first and foremost everyone knows the house rules and make sure to look below click that subscribe button and smash that bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content like tonight's interview and gentlemen Man, I'm happy to be back chatting with you guys, chatting with our guests. I'm ready to rock and roll. What do you say? I'm ready, always ready to rock and roll. I got something special. I know we got baby Thanos over here, Steve, on the side, but I, I got the Ampsco 1975 Captain America. Hi, I'm Cap. I'm a baby Captain America, and it looks a little like Steve, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, look look at that. Look like me. Come on, yeah, a little now. bit, baby Stevie. Why not? Baby Stevie Rogers. Why not, Steve? Why not? Just wanted God to show that. <laughs> That's a piece of memory. You a warehouse to supply, uh, you know, to hold all of these little obscure things that you're getting. Good Lord. <laughs> if he wasn't mint in the box, I would have given him the little B. <laughs> it looked like Steve. I had to get it. Cost me a pretty penny. But anyway. I can imagine. Yeah, 1975 Amsco. And why those were so rare was they made a Spider-Man, a Batman, a Superman, a Captain Marvel, a Shazam, and a, um, and a uh, Robin, and a, and a Wonder Woman. But the reason why those are so rare is those were in the girl section back in the 1975 with all the other dolls. So people never really saw them. And they were in all the catalogs, and they were very hard to find. When I saw the little Stevie Rogers, little Stevie Thanos over here, I had to get one. It reminded me of Steve. But, okay. Anyway, Steve, tell me tell me what's going on. We have a big, big guest tonight that uh, I, I don't really see many, many interviews with this guy. But, oh, he's done some pretty big stuff, and I'm glad that we have him. Tell me about who's our guest today, Steve. All right. So we are going to take a little trip back to uh, this Inca's heyday, of course, the 1980s. And it's really funny. Uh, my three, he's actually one of my three favorite Incas of the 1980s that popped up, um, you know, including uh, Brett Breeding and Joe Rubenstein. I uh, love those two guys. And Mr. Bob McLeod fits right in there with them. And as soon as I mention that name, Many of you who have seen his work will know of that crystal clear clarity, that inking that yeah. is personified by beautiful, clean lines. Beautiful. Uh, it was the 1980s, and it was like, wow, there's a whole new breed of artists coming into town, and these guys are really sharp. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to uh, speak with Bob today and get some of the goods and get into the weeds and find out who, what, why, and when. Ooh. And what about you now? What do we got? We got a good guest today. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I've been wanting to have this guest on for quite some time. Huge fan of his work, the stuff he's done, things he's created. I'm ready to dive in. And as, as I like to take from Steve, I'm ready to dive into the weeds. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm gonna dive into the weeds because Coke, oh, he did one of my favorite, favorite. I got obsessed 
I, I liked Mad Magazine, but I got obsessed with Crazy because you couldn't really find it. And at comic book stores and stuff, they were piled away. And when you got an occasional one, but I got obsessed with Teen Hulk. And now when I found out this guy was behind that, I was obsessed because I actually, Steve, I know this is going to sound crazy. Because just for the fact that I couldn't see it that much and it was just in my head, I there was a time there that I liked the Teen Hulk strips better than the actual Hulk comic books. I know that's crazy to sound, but I was so crazy about them because I couldn't really find them and I just got enthralled by them. But oh my God, Teen Hulk, why? We'll have to ask Bob McCloud why. Okay, Niall, why don't you bring in the bad boy? <laughs> Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for being here, Bob. It's an honor to have you. Uh, Steve said it best, the clean, clean lines. That's what I remember. And uh, I'll never forget, obviously, the New Mutants uh, graphic novel you did with uh, you did with uh, Chris and stuff. That was, that was the first time I saw your art and stuff that I remember those. I remember those graphic novels always in the back of the comic book store being shown. Like they were never in the front. And I was always like, "You see those? What are those? You know, you, I saw the Hooky, the Spider-Man Hooky. I saw the uh, the Hulk yeah. and the Thing. You know that that the the the, the Starlin and uh, um, what was it, Steve? The uh, the it was the yeah, Hulk yeah, and the Thing Marvel. one. Yeah, that yeah. was uh, yeah, and uh, also uh, Bunny Wrightson, right? Yeah, Bernie Wrightson, and I always saw that X, that New Mutants, and that that is something you that was like a staple in the '80s. I just remember that so vividly in my head. So you were always there during those during those years, and I didn't even know. But once again, thank you for being here. It's an honor, and uh, like how we like to start this and all that. How did little Bobby get into the get into this? <laughs> what what were the first comics he saw, and then how did he get into the business? Please take us on our your journey. You know that's that's quite a long story. Um, I I was not a big comic book fan. Um, I read as a kid. I read the Harvey line of comics. You know, Richie Rich and um, uh, Casper the Ghost. Um, <laughs> what was the little girl? Uh, little Dot. Little Dot. There were others. Sabrina. There were, yeah, there Sabrina? was a bunch of them, but anyway, all the, all these humor comics, um, and then my sister start. My sister is two years older than I am. She started buying Archie comics, and I liked Archie comics. Um, and then I saw some Superman comics. We used to go down to the dime store. You know, at that time, this was the 1950s. Uh, they had dime stores. There actually a lot of stuff you could buy for a dime. And uh, that's where we bought our comics, um, which I think comics were a dime back then. And uh, I, I saw these Superman comics, so I started buying those. And then um, my sister would read the Superman and I would read the Archie. We swap back and forth. Um, but I pretty much stuck with all the Superman family line of comics, you know, uh, Crypto, the Super Dog, and Super Baby, and Super Boy, and Super Family. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, there was a hundred of them. Um, yeah. So I, w I was reading those Superman comics all through grade school. And then when I got to middle school, uh, you know, probably 13 years old, I discovered Mad Magazine. And so that was the 60s. And Mad Magazine was incredible. You know, it wasn't uh, just silly humor for little kids. It, they had some good political satire in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they had a whole array of just genius artists. You know, Al Jaffe just died uh, yeah. a couple days ago and just genius, you know. And I fell in love with Mort Drucker's work, the satires of the TV shows and the movies by Mort Drucker. Oh, yeah. And I, I basically wanted to be Mort Drucker. You know, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, art just like that. Um, and maybe my, my goal might have been eventually to work for Mad Magazine but, you know, I really liked humor. I wanted to maybe have my own newspaper comic strip, um, which I did when I was like 19 or 20. I submitted a little uh, humorous comic strip about a, a funny uh, private detective called Tom Nosy. 
and got rejected. It was it was <laughs> it was pretty stupid. So it got rejected. Um, and then I was working at a grocery store, loading shelves, stock boy, you know, at a grocery store. And uh, this was after I had gone to college and art school and quit because they were telling me, you know, I was wasting my time doing cartoons. I should be studying, you know, painting and being a fine artist. And I didn't want to be a fine art painter. I wanted to be a cartoonist. You know, I wanted to do humor. I, I like black lines on white paper, you know, all the things you could do with, with just uh, inking. Um, and, and so uh, this guy that I was working with at the, at the supermarket, when he found out I could draw, he, he was a big comic uh, fan, a big Marvel Comics fan. And he said, oh, you got to work for Marvel Comics. Um, and I had never even thought about drawing comic books. You know, I'm, I'm 20 years old, never thought about co drawing comic books. And I said, well, Okay, I, I could, I could, I could try that. I'll, I'll start there. And I was thinking, then I'd move on to work for Walt Disney or get my own comic strip or, or whatever. I was thinking of it like a stepping stone, because um, you know I didn't know anything about comic books except Superman, and the artist they had on Superman the whole time I was growing up was Kurt Swan. Yeah. Now, Kurt's an incredible artist, you know, really good artist. Um, and when I finally went to New York and saw one of his originals, I was blown away. But reading comics as a kid, I felt they were kind of stayed, you know, just kind of not exciting. So I, I didn't get excited by comic books the way I did with Mad Magazine. You know, Jack Davis and Mort Drucker and Wally Wood, um, Al Jaffe, uh, Dave Burt, all, all the guys with Mad Magazine just really knocked me out. So anyway, I, you know, long story short, I, I went to New York, um, tried to get into comics and, and got rejected. You know, um, the art director at DC Comics with Joe Orlando at the time, a long time great artist from EC Comics, originally in the fifties. Um, Joe Orlando was very nice, looked at my samples, uh, and said, well, you know, you need to go back to school and learn how to draw. <laughs> oh. that, that was the first negative comment that I can remember about my art, really. Um, you know, I, you know, you grow up, you know, you draw better than your friends and your family. So everybody's just telling you how good you are. All the time. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> I finally try to get work doing this. They tell me how bad I am. And everybody I met in New York could draw better than I could. It was, it was crazy. So, you know, I didn't, I wasn't offended. I was just puzzled. But, you know, what does he mean? I need to learn how to draw. Everybody's always telling me how well I could draw. Right. So I just went back and started looking at some comics. Um, you know, what are they doing that I'm not doing? What, what do these guys know how to do that I don't know do? So I just kept doing samples, uh, getting nowhere with Marvel and DC, and uh, happened to be uh, at the same time trying to get in was Pat Broderick. Uh, so we met up at uh, Phil Suling's New York Comic Con, and um, he was trying to get in, I was trying to get in, we became roommates. Um, he got into this thing called the DC Apprenticeship Program at the time. <clears throat> and I didn't get it. I tried. I didn't get it. But, you know, I kept doing my samples, trying to learn, figure this stuff out. And Pat, being up at DC, met Neil Adams. You know, Neil Adams had his continuity studios. Yeah. And um, Neil was kind of the, the big shot of comics in, this was 1974. Oh, yeah. um, he was as kind of like the pinnacle of comic art at the time. And Pat kept telling me, you got to meet Neil Adams. You got to meet Neil Adams. And I said, Neil Adams, just another comic artist. What, what's the big deal about meeting Neil Adams? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know anything. You know, I was so naive. Um, so I, all right, I'll, I'll go meet Neil Adams. So I went up to continuity, showed Neil my work. Neil looks at it and he said, uh, well, what do you want? And I said, well, anything that pays because I had sold my car to finance a trip to New York to try to start my career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was down to my, like my last $10. I was going to call my parents to get bus money back to Tampa. I'm from Tampa, Florida originally. And um, I said, anything to pays. Um, so Neil picked up the phone, called John Verporten, the production manager at Marvel Comics and said, I got a guy here. 
uh, some art potential, but a lot of a lot of potential as a letterer. And he said, do you need anybody in the production department? Um, and Johnny said, yeah, we could use somebody. And so just on Neil's say so, this was like a Friday. On Monday, I started at Marvel Comics in the production department doing lettering corrections, which turned out to be an amazing way to get into the business because I was right there in the office. John Romita was like five feet from where I was sitting. Uh, uh, Mike Esposito and Frank Giacoya were working in the office at that time, you know, like two feet from me. Their desks were right there in the production department. Um, Stan's office was right down the hall, Marie Severin down the other way. Um, you know, the editors were all around. So it was a great way to meet everybody and um, show my work, my samples that I was working on. I could just show it to the editors every day. Um, it, was, it was a much warmer, friendlier company at that time, you know, in 74, it was like a small family. Um, it was It was a wonderful way to work that, you know, I didn't know... I kind of took it for granted at the time because I didn't have anything to compare it to. Um, so I just said, well, okay, this is the way the world is, you know, and it stands right down the corner there. Um, it, it was wonderful. And so eventually, as I was working in production, all the best artists working for Marvel, their work would come across my desk. And I would have to, you know, eventually work my way up from lettering corrections to art corrections. I would have to move Conan's sword a little bit to make room for this balloon and on a piece of John B. Sima artwork. And I, I, my God. So I could I could study John B. Sima's work and all these, Barry Smith started doing Conan and I could study all this great stuff. And it helped me learn what was expected, what I had to do. And, you know, like, I don't know, three or four months later, I started getting my own work. You talk about a master class seeing just wow, the- I know. Yeah. Just yeah. the group, the group, and and you were so naive to know like the greatest of the greats were right there. Like I mean, like of all time. I mean, and you were you were yeah, absorbing I that. I didn't know. I barely knew who Jack Kirby was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Marvel, Marvel Revolution. You know, I wasn't reading Spider Man in the '60s. I was reading Mad Magazine. So I barely knew Jack Kirby from Frank Frazetta, from John Buscema, from from Neil Adams. Anybody? I you know I didn't know. Wow. So I had to really get up to speed on all this stuff, you know, and, and, you know, find out about all this great stuff. But in a way, that naivety of not having your ego involved, because you could have probably been more intimidated. You were just kind of taking these guys in and being like, OK, I got to do this and this. Wow. Go ahead, Steve. That's crazy. <laughs> well, uh, oh. I want to go back again. I always have to go back to the beginning here because. 99.9% .9 of anyone who is in this industry wanted to be an artist. That was the first thing they tried. Uh, I'm one of them, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm curious, at what age did you start drawing? Uh, and then how long did it take before you realized that you could draw better than your friends? And people were like, wow, look at this. Because, you know, everyone has that moment. I remember when I was in, um, you know, one of our art classes, we were all trying to draw. But there was one person in there whose drawing was way ahead of any of us. We were just like, oh, my word. And he's like, it's pretty easy, right? This isn't it. And we're like, no. It's not. So I'm always very curious on these initial steps because it's fascinating to see when the coin drops and you realize, wait a minute, I can draw. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Steve, I feel like I was born being able to draw. I started drawing that I remember around age four or five. Uh, I would copy the cartoons off the cereal box in the morning as I was eating breakfast. Oh, yeah. And I did one. There was a little on Wheat Honeys. I remember there was a little character called Buffalo Bee that I copied. <laughs> and my mom looked at it and said, wow, that's that's really good. Um that's much better than I could do. And my mom couldn't draw. So that's not saying much, but you know, she was very complimentary and my dad was compliment complimentary and it built up my confidence and I enjoyed it. So I kept up doing the, the little cartoon stuff and, um, and I got to school and I mean, obviously we didn't even have an art class, but so somehow everybody in, in my class, 
found out I could draw. I don't remember how, but I kind of became known as a school artist all, all through elementary school. Um, I would do the decorations for the door for the Holloway, you know, for Halloween or Christmas. I would be the one decorating the classroom door. Mm -hmm. um, it was funny because I got this friend of mine, uh, Frankie, uh, to help me in the cloakroom. We'd be designing the door. He'd get out of classwork and I'd get out of classwork to be doing this cartoon stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a great gig. And um, so all through school, I mean, I was just known Bob McLeod can draw. They, they would bring me into other classrooms to draw a cow or whatever if they were discussing something. Um, and I'd never drawn a cow before, but, <laughs> but I did my best. And um, so then I got up into middle school. And um, again, you know, it's just uh, I was the, the best artist that I knew. High school, I, I was the best artist. I was known as, as uh, I got the they give out these who's who awards at senior year, you know, uh, who's best looking or who's most likely to succeed, who's, you know, whatever, best football star, whatever. I got who's who for art talent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just, it, drawing came easily to, I took it for granted that I could draw. I was just going to be an artist when I grew up. I never even gave it a second thought. That's made up my mind when I was five, I was going to be a cartoonist, you know? And, and you never um, swayed from that. That's all you ever wanted to be? Just straight, straight through? Well, you know, I, I started playing the trumpet in middle school and high school, and I was first year trumpet. I was pretty good trumpeter, but I happened to sit next to this guy. I swear he was the best trumpeter in the state. He was, he was like pro level in high school. I said, well, you know, I'm never going to be as good as this guy, but I can draw better than him. <laughs> so I said I better stick with the drawing. So I wanted to follow up with, okay, you, you've you been drawing, you've gone a long time, you've seen all this access, you know, uh, you've seen these great artists. What was your parents' reaction when you said, I'm going to sell my car, go <laughs> all the way to New York, and just be out there on the, you know, you hang on this washing line and you're holding on. You're, you're going to be out there. What, you know, cause parents usually nine times out of 10 are like, well, well, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious. What, did, what was their reaction to you saying that? Well, you got to go back a little. I went to college. Uh, my parents had never been to college. So my older sister was the first one in our family to go to college. I went to college after her. She was a straight A student. I was more like an AB student. Um, but I went to college and quit college. Imagine my parents when I quit college because I wanted to be a cartoonist. <laughs> and uh, they were fine. They said, you know, you draw really well. You know, we believe in you. They, I always got unconditional support from my parents. I was very lucky. Um, wow. And then I went to art school, quit art school. Imagine that, you know, a year later, I've had enough art school and my parents must have been thinking, what is with this kid? Uh -huh. um, and then I sold my car. I said, I, I, I'm going to sell my car. I'm going to go to New York, uh, try to be an artist. And they would go for it. I, you know, they, they supported me. Um, my dad was a construction worker. I used to help him as a teenager on his various jobs, installing air conditioners or building roofs or, or, or whatever. Um, I knew one thing I didn't want to do was manual labor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not want to have my dad's job. I just wanted to be paid to draw. And I said, what can I do to be paid to draw? And then when my friend said, try comic books, I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. Um, and when I went up to New York, you know, I, like I said, I was getting rejected. I was getting nowhere. I, was, I went up in July, July, August, into September. I was getting nowhere. Um, I was losing all my money. Is that 1974? 100% just supported me the whole time. Um, even when I was getting rejected, you would think they'd say, okay, you made your shot. Come on, hack, come on back and get a real job. But no, they, you know, they said, we know you, this is your passion. You want to do this. And they just kept supporting me until I finally, finally got my foot in the door. And Bob, just like Steve said, uh, it was 1974, correct? That was 1974 yeah. at yeah. that time? I, I mean, it's very interesting when we talk to, you know, pros and veterans of the industry and we all we hear their stories and they all have these like little magical Wizard of Oz ways of doing things. It's like <laughs> you, you throwing things to the wind. I mean, it's just amazing how many do that and don't make it. But when we talk to yeah. you, you guys are those 
that rare one percent point oh 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 one oh percent i don't know that kind of cracked through and you threw everything to the wind followed that yellow brick road and it led to success and now your characters and your drawings are like you know i mean in the movies and everything i mean that now did your parents understand how big you got and what you were doing did they really like when they saw your stuff in stores like look at this that's my kid did did they yeah did they you know my my dad was my biggest fan really um he passed away a couple decades ago and um he would get so excited he would he, we'd be in the grocery store checking out the grocery store and and um, he'd see I don't know if you saw a comic or he was just, he was so excited that I was there with him and I had made a success in comics. And he told the checkout girl, my son here draws, <laughs> I'm so here. I'm so here draws comic books. <laughs> he was like, dad, she doesn't want it. She doesn't care. <laughs> oh. But yeah, he, he was very proud of me. My mom was very proud of me. Um, and even before, this was way before I had huge success, but just the fact that I was being published and being paid. I had a, a steady job. You know, yeah. I, I was actually making a decent salary doing what I wanted to do my whole life. Yeah, they, they were very proud of me. Yeah. My gosh. Go ahead, Steve. My gosh. So, obviously, um, if you started working there in 74, of course, the editor would have been Roy Thomas at the time, if I'm right. correct. Uh, but then you would transition up through, you know, the quick, you know, bang, 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 bang of all the other editors. And then you would end up with Mr. Jim Shooter. Um, and just as that's happening, you know, you're, you know, you're basically getting to the point where you're going to be given, you know, uh, an important project. What was the first important project that you were given that you thought to yourself, all right, I'm about to make the next level here. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have to nail this because this, this is the next level for me. I mean, it was a series of, of steps. So I, I was in the production department and Mike Esposito said, uh, you know, you can learn how to ink faster than you can learn how to pencil. Um, you know, this was before I was getting any work and I had never even thought about being an inker. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know anything. Um, Wow. So I started doing backgrounds for Mike Esposito, and uh, that was easy. So I started doing inking samples, and next thing you know, I'm getting inking work, and my inking career kind of took off. Marvel liked my inks. Uh, I started going over to DC. I would get a five dollar raise because DC wanted to steal artists away from Marvel, so they give me a five dollar raise. And then I, you know, Marvel wanted me back again. They'd give me a five dollar raise. So I, <laughs> back and forth between marvel and dc a few times just to get the five dollar raise and um you know i was inking doing a lot of inking on the black and white magazines they started me there doing the kung fu magazines you know um all that stuff and i you know my i wasn't being able to get any penciling work they didn't think they thought my penciling was too uh, uh stiff you know not enough action to my poses and stuff i could draw but i, I couldn't draw exciting if you've seen that how to draw comics the marvel way you got the marvel way and then you got the the regular yes. way. I, was, I was doing the regular way <laughs> so i had to learn the marvel way um so it took like five years of really studying uh and i studied john buscema uh studied john buscema for his figure poses his his storytelling his panel mm -hmm. Uh, composition and everything uh, and then I was studying Neil Adams for the finish for the rendering um, all the all the flash and the, the technique um, but finally like it took me five years 1979 before I got my first shot at penciling a superhero comic um, and then just you know like uh, three years later uh, they gave me the new mutant so when I got that first penciling job now I was already at that time, like one of the top inkers. Um, so my inking was going great. And um, finally I get this penciling job. So now I figured, okay, I've, I've shifted out of inking into penciling because so many inkers, you know, once they, the, the editors think of you as, a, as an inker, 
that's they pigeonhole you. This guy's an inker. They they mm -hmm. say, well, he can't draw. He's an inker. Um, so when you convince them that oh, he can also draw, that's a that's a big deal. So then I started getting some fill-ins where uh, I would pencil and ink uh, some Spider-Man fill-ins. And they always started guys on Spider-Man at that time because they figured, well, Spider-Man's so great, they can't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did several Spider-Man fill-ins and then suddenly they needed a fill-in on the X-Men. Um, I forget if uh, Dave Cockrum had just left uh, maybe and um, they, they needed somebody for that month's X-Men. And Jim Sherman had started penciling it, and I don't know if he got sick or he got another job offer or, or what, but he kind of quit right uh, right after he just started laying it out. So some he had like the finished splash page and then just kind of very partially inked panels here and there throughout the rest of the job. So they needed somebody to take that and finish that job, and they asked me to do it. God knows why I was I was around. You know, we used to be able to hang out in the Marvel office and when something came up, say, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. You can't do that anymore. But in, in 1980, you could do that. Um, so I uh, said, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll do that X-Men job. And uh, so I penciled that. Uh, Joe Rubenstein inked it. I inked, I think, the last two pages. And then the following issue, they still needed somebody. So they said, go ahead and, and do this next job. So I said, well, I'm drawing the X-Men. I've made it. <laughs> and then they said, uh, oh, and by the way, we're we're starting up this this uh, spinoff of the X-Men, um, kind of a younger team of X-Men. We're going to try to make it more multicultural. Uh, Chris has some ideas for characters. Um, we don't have a name for it yet, uh, but we need somebody uh, to visualize uh, Chris's ideas. And um, you could be co-creator on that book. Um, I really wanted to draw the X-Men, you know, <laughs> I was having a good time drawing the X-Men. That was a top selling book, uh, good royalties. And then they offered me this co-creator job on a project that might've gone nowhere. You know, it, it might've been canceled after a few months if it didn't succeed. And it was a tough decision. Uh, but I said, well, you know, how often am I going to get a chance to be co-creator on a new series for Marvel Comics? So I couldn't really pass that up. Um, so I almost reluctantly, I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do the new, or I'll do this new title. We didn't have the name yet. Uh, so I went with that. Well, before you get into that's where, yeah, I mean, that's where you become known in the whole universe. But before that, I just want to get really quickly, uh, like I, I said earlier, Crazy Magazine Teen Hulk. How, just tell me how that fell onto your lap and stuff because I fell in love with that strip. I just, it was so it was such a part of my childhood because once again it was hard to find those crazy magazines. I could find the Mad magazines. Yeah, you know the, the comic crazy. shops didn't know where to the comic shops didn't know where to put these big magazines. They didn't fit on the comic rack, so they had to actually build shelves for the the black and white magazines uh, uh, and. So I can see where crazy might be hard to find, but my very first work, my, pub, my first published work at Marvel was actually a satire. I was still working in the production department. Uh, Marv Wolfman came up to me. He might've been in the editor at that time. You know, they went through Roy Thomas and Marv Wolfman and Lynn Ween. Um, I, I don't forget who else. All, Jerry, Jerry. Editor in chief, Jerry Conway. Yeah. Um, and so Marv came up to me in production and said, hey, uh, would you want to do this satire of uh, Westworld, the movie Westworld? Uh, I need an artist. I'm, I'm writing the script. And I said, yeah, sure. Um, and it was great. Marvel paid for Marv and I to go see the movie. And they gave me these glossy photos to work from. Yeah. So that's when I first realized, hey, you know, I've hit the big time. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I really made it. Um, doing this satire of Westworld for Crazy Magazine, which is an awful job. You know, I, I didn't know how to do comics. I didn't, I was no more trucker. I was, I was still learning so much stuff. Um, I mean, there's, there's things about that job that I like, but, you know, I didn't know what I was doing basically. So anyway, that was for Crazy Magazine. So then I did other work for Crazy Magazine. I did a list of things, uh, you know, TV scenes you want to watch, you know, Mad Magazine had, 
something similar to that TV scenes. Uh, and so, so crazy did these TV scenes. I did those. Um, and then uh, might've done another satire before that, but uh, Marie Severin had been doing the teen Hulk strip. Yeah. And Marie w was also designing all these covers. She's so underrated for uh, all the covers that she did oh. the compositions for, you know, for Marvel. And Maybe she got busy on that and and didn't have time for Teen Hulk, and they knew I could do funny stuff. And they said, "So, Bob, why don't you do Teen Hulk this month?" And uh, so I did it and absolutely loved it. It's <laughs> it's some of my favorite work of my career. Wow! And it was so much fun working with Jim Owsley at at the time, um, doing these silly stories. It wasn't even the real Hulk. It was some guy. They called Teen Hulk, you know, um, Chester yeah. Weems. And it was just silly, fun stuff. Um, so I, I just kept doing Teen Hulk even after I was doing the New Mutants. Uh, you know, wow. for the next, I did them mostly all around that time, 82, 83, while I was doing the New Mutants. Wow. I mean, that's incredible. I, I Like I said, I loved when, when it just was genius. And speaking of Marie, I'm going to go on record here and say one of the greatest caricature artists of all time. I mean, she is, like you said, so underrated and stuff, so multi-versatile, but like her cartoons of like not brand, all that stuff, like just I, genius, even of the, of uh, the, you know, the, the bullpen and all that stuff was just so incredible. Yeah. She was incredible, and uh, I think I think just underappreciated, maybe because she was a woman. I don't know. You know, her her brother John Severin, big name artist, long time, uh, oh. got so much respect, and I think Marie did so much more than John Severin. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. You know, it's it's yes. incredible, and just doesn't get the respect. Yeah, go ahead now. I agree. Yeah. That no, actually, I would love to. Uh, I know we kind of stopped on this because John would go back, but I'd love to hear more about now. You know, you you're signed up now for this new book. You're working with Chris Claremont. Can we dive into that whole process of of really the new mutants coming to be? Yeah, you know, Chris wrote the first Spider-Man job that I did, the first uh, superhero penciling job that I did. That uh, was Marvel Team Up number eighty six with Spider-Man and the Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. So Chris knew my work. Um, maybe why they asked me. Uh, he liked what I did on the X Men fill ins. Um, you know, he they had had experience before with some inkers trying to do penciling, and the inkers, even if they could draw, they didn't know how to do storytelling. So Chris was in, was uh, impressed with my storytelling. So um, we, I was living in. Uh, I had moved back to Tampa. Once I started getting steady work in New York, you know, New York was so expensive to live in. Uh, I tried living in Brooklyn and Manhattan and Queens, and it just kept getting, rents kept going up. And I figured, well, I'm getting steady work now. I can go back home to Tampa where it's cheap. Um, so I went, I moved back home to Tampa. Uh, I had been up in New York uh, talking, turning in some, maybe the X-Men job, uh, talking to Louise uh, Simonson, uh, when they offered me the new mutants. Uh, but then I was I was living in Tampa. So Chris and I were talking over the phone a lot, discussing um, what should this comic be called? And are we going to have uh, this character or this character? Because Chris has got all these ideas, you know, that he maybe never even used. He's just an idea guy. And so um, we were trying to nail down the characters and their names and their powers, how their powers would manifest. Um, a lot of talking back and forth on the phone. And, and I did sketches of what they might look like. You know, was Cannonball going to be some big, strong, beefy guy? Uh, or the way I ended up doing him, just kind of awkward, you know, hillbilly guy. Um, you know, where was Sunspot going to be big like the Hulk when he used his powers? Or was he going to stay a little guy? All this stuff, um, exactly how were these characters going to look? You know, exactly what were their names going to be? And I, I said, um, you know, I, I like to draw girls and you are good at writing girls. Let's have more females on this team than males. Because up to that time, there was usually like a token female on, on the team. Um, so Chris said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So we ended up having, uh, you know, more females than males. 
and um, just all that stuff. Then, you know, they, we're talking about what the book should be called. And uh, I don't know if it was Louise or Chris came up with the New Mutants. And I said, by God, that's a bad name. <laughs> I said, I really, I really don't. Surely we can come up with something better than New Mutants. Uh, you know, because the original X-Men title was going to be The Mutants. Uh, and I don't know why Stan didn't go with that, why he called it the X-Men instead, but right, right. Um, that's where we got mutants from. Uh, and since these were newer mutants, just the new mutants was all anybody could come up with. I, I couldn't think of anything better. Um, so that's what we went with. Wow. And <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. But I, I, just really quick, Steve, before I give it to you, like the how long did you do the new mutants for? Like, I know you did the first one. Did you Did you start doing the issues after? And stuff to Bob? Yeah, so I, I was starting to pencil the first issue. I got maybe five pages in or so. Um, and at the same time, 1982, they were, they were starting up their graphic novel line. And uh, they had done the death of Captain Marvel and one or two others. And they needed a graphic novel for number four. And they said, hey, let's, let's take this new title, The New Mutants, and make it a graphic novel. Right, right. And um, we were all very excited because, you know, this was this new thing, graphic novels. They had better printing. They were bigger. Um, it, was, it was a kind of a prestige thing. So we were excited about it. But the thing is, with the comic, The New Mutants, uh, there was, there was, it was unscheduled. So I was going to have all the time in the world to just do my absolute best work. And then when they decided to make it a graphic novel, suddenly it was twice as many pages and it was it had a schedule and i was already behind schedule no. so and then on top of that at the same time i i decided to get to get married so <laughs> i had to actually ink pages on my honeymoon <laughs> to try to, meet, <laughs> try to meet the deadline they were going to give the inking uh to armando gill because uh they said look we got to get this book out they got a deadline they got the printer's going to charge us more if we don't get this book to the printer and I thought, oh, you, you got to let me ink this. I mean, it, it's a graphic novel. It's my first series. I have to yeah. ink it. Come on. Um, so I talked them into letting me do it. They said, okay, but, we, you know, we got to have the pages by this. So I was just inking like crazy, drawing as fast as I could draw, inking as fast as I could draw uh -huh. as ink. Um, and as soon as the graphic novel was done, I had to jump on the first issue um, I gave them a list of all these inkers that I would like to ink me on the, on the series. And I had nine inkers and I said, well, I'll just run it off to 10 inkers. And so the 10th name was Mike Gustavich. Now Mike's a great guy and he's a good inker, good artist. But at the time he wasn't very experienced. He had been working on, uh, some title justice machine. I think it was called. Mm. Uh, for a small publisher, and um, it, I guess everybody, every other inker on my list was busy and couldn't. Now you'd think a new series like this, it was going to be a graphic novel, and then a series, you'd think they would get one of their top inkers on it. Right? right. No, <laughs> they wouldn't. So, I mean, Mike, like I said, nice guy, good artist, but he just didn't ink things the way that I thought they should be inked. Um, and I got to admit, you know, my pencils were raw. This was my first series. I hadn't had much uh, experience penciling. So I was still working out my compositions and my figure poses and everything and trying to draw as fast as I could draw, no time to think. So I must have, it must have been hard to ink my pencils. And then I wasn't happy with it, um, jumped on the second issue, deadline, 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 drawing as fast as I could draw. By the third issue, I was doing half breakdowns uh, because I, I just couldn't draw. I needed time to think. You know, I, I got to think, how am I going to pose this figure? Because I had had so little experience drawing. Mm. Um, and I just didn't like the way the book was looking. I was just so unhappy. Uh, with the way the art looked. Um, so I said, well, let me let me try inking. Uh, maybe I can control the look of the art better if I do the inking. Just give me somebody to do breakdowns and I'll do the inking. And so they got Sal Bissema to do the breakdowns and, and I started inking. And I figured, well, 
it's my book, it's my series. I'm going to make it look the way I wanted to look. So I didn't worry about trying to keep any of Sal's style. I tried to make it as much look like my style, just using his storytelling. But, you know, again, Sal Bissima, great artist, you know, one of the best artists at, at Marvel. Um, but he was maybe penciling three books a month at that point. Yeah. And he was more into a very, uh, what would you call it? just a production line mentality of, of how you do this job. Um, so he was doing a lot of um, <clears throat> not close ups and long shots, but intermediate shots. Mm -hmm. um, he was doing, Sal had a way of, of doing uh, the arms and the legs in the same pose often. He had a, a way of doing things that he had done, obviously, you know, for for years, uh, very quickly telling a story very clearly, but a certain way that isn't my way. Um, and so I just, after a couple issues of inking Sal and trying so hard to make it look like my art instead of Sal's art, I just, again, I just wasn't happy with the way the, the art was looking. I said, this isn't how I want my art to look. Um, so after like, I think I worked through the eighth issue, um, might've done, uh, I think I did up covers up to number 10. And I said, you know, I went to the editor, Louise, and I said, I, you know, I'm just I'm miserable. I, I gotta, I gotta move on. I, I'm just not happy with the way my art's looking. And, you know, Louise tried her best to keep me on the book. She said, you know, this is the biggest mistake you'll ever make getting off this book. You should really think about this, stay on the, stay on this series. And I said, I'm miserable. I can't do this anymore. Wow. Um, so I left the series reluctantly. Um, and in retrospect, you know, I should have stayed on the series. Obviously that was what I'm best known for, even though I only did a handful of issues um, because I was co-creator with Chris and um, it was a top selling comic. You know, this is, again, remember, the fan market was just building at that time. Um, we didn't have a lot of feedback from the fans. There weren't that many conventions. I didn't even know that the book was a big success. I mean, I knew it was doing okay. Everybody liked it that I talked to, but it wasn't the, as if it came out today. It would be a totally different experience. But back then, I, I didn't know. Um, I All I knew was I'd... My, I can do better art than this. And so I just, you know, I ended up leaving after a few issues. Wow. Go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> wow. That, That's deep. That, that yeah. last couple of minutes right there. Yeah. Where you're explaining things. I was going to ask a question and, and you, without knowing, you answered <laughs> my questions because for years, everyone knows I'm the biggest Sabasema fan in the world. Okay. Uh, I even have a Salbacema tattoo on my arm. I'm literally yep. a Salbacema maniac. But <laughs> I remember at the time, uh, Sal was drawing Incredible Hulk and Rom. And I would look at that art. And then when I saw the work in New Mutants, I kept like going backwards and forwards going, <laughs> I, something's different. How is, how is this happening? I was just like, oh my word, the the sheer sharpness and the roundness of the figures in the New Mutants was so much better. Um, yeah. Of course, I didn't like, at the time, I think uh, Al Milgram was inking uh, Sal on the Hulk and also on Rom. And then sometimes Sal would ink himself. But it was getting to the point where he was having to draw so fast that he was getting angular. But then when I saw the New Mutants, I was like, oh, the what is going on here? So after all of these years, <laughs> it's thousands of years since those books came out. You just answered that magnificently. So I always had like a little hint that, you know, you were working a little bit harder because Sal's up and hey, you know, whoo, I don't want to piss Sal off. But it, yeah, you know, I don't, the best I looking don't... Sal art from that early 1980s. It really was. Yeah, I don't want to disparage Sal because, like I say, he's a great artist. If you have a tattoo, obviously you're a fan of his. Um, if you look at Sal inking his own pencils, 
then he's thinking more about creating art that he wants to look a certain way. But when he's when he's just doing storytelling breakdowns, and these weren't even finished pencils, they're breakdowns. All they're hiring him to do is storytell. He's not invested in it in the way that I was invested in it. Um, it's it's a job to him where he's got a paycheck and obviously he's an artist. He takes pride in his work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying he's not invested in it the same way that Chris and I were invested in it. Oh, of course. Yes. Um, I think it's a, it's definitely a great point. And uh, about five years ago, I got into a huge debate. I mean, it went on for years. Me and Jim Lee were going backwards and forwards about South Asema. Um, and I was trying to explain Sal's virtues and yeah. Jim was like, oh, um, so basically what I was trying to show him was that Sal after a while became this guy that was like, oh, we're late on a book. Sal, can you jump over and do the book? Yeah, so right. obviously he got faster and faster and faster to get these paychecks and to help the company out. But the art that he was doing in 1971, 72, wow, that's unbelievable. Right. Yeah, but that art that you did with him in 1982, it took me back to that because I was like, "Whoa, this is clean. This is beautiful," and sitting here in 2023 and having all those questions answered to me on a personal <laughs> note is it, it just a wonderful thing. And I didn't even—I was going to ask a question. I—I I, I didn't even prompt it. So I want to I thank you for that. And, and even as a kid and uneducated and looking at Sal's stuff. I always knew that so subconsciously, like he was just pounding this stuff out because you could tell. I know exactly what you're saying, Bob. Like it was starting to get very angular because you know he's and all and a lot of his panels kind of looked alike. If you went to different, uh, mag they were still yeah. dynamic. They were still yes. great storytelling, but you can tell. And those Hulk ones bothered me too because it it looked different because you could I you know I I knew. I kind of knew, even un uneducatedly, he was, he looks like he's speeding through these and all that stuff. And he, and he actually, he was, and he could yeah, get the and, deadlines. Yeah. yeah. I don't care. Who, I don't care who you are. You can't draw five pages a day and do amazing artwork. <clears throat> you can do professional artwork. You can, you can do competent artwork, but it's going to be not your most imaginative, uh, interesting artwork when you're trying to do five pages a day, which is what he was doing. Yeah. You know, it, I also just to carry on on the, the specifics of the inking and how much of an effect and how it is looking on the page. The next time that I looked at some art that I quickly rushed to the credit section to look at the inker was there were some issues that you did uh, with Dale, Mc, Dale uh, Keown on the Hulk. Dale Keown. And <clears throat> his art, he was just magnificent. His lines look clean, but like, as soon as, you know, I, I saw your inking on it, I was just like, we have just entered a new level of Hulk art. This is, I, and I remember I switched, <laughs> I looked at the credit section, I was like, oh, that makes sense. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah. It's truly astounding. I think it's what, 1990, I think it is. I think 1990. Yeah, 89, 90, 1990. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so after all those years, you know, from 82 up there, you know, I thought, my word, he hasn't lost one tiny thing. The inking is still as sharp. The dedication and the art was just incredible. I, just, I don't know whether you've ever thought of that or when you did those pages of how much of an effect they were had. Because within the Hulk community, and I'm sure John, was, we were like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. A level. And you're there, yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, Dale, Dale's an amazing artist, and I was really excited to be inking his pencils. I loved his his pencils. Um, I don't remember exactly how I got that job, but I, they gave it to me, and um, it was so much fun inking over Dale's drawings. And his drawings were tight pencils. A lot of that rendering was there. Not exactly as I did it, but certainly um, I was following his lead and trying to just do what he was doing, only clean it up and, and enhance it where I could. Um, and then after I inked that first issue and he saw how the inking looked, he started loosening up in some panels and pages uh, because he, he told me, he said, well, I know 
you're going to fix it up. If I, if I don't have time to make it the way I want to look, you'll, you'll, you'll take it. Uh, so he, he was comfortable with what I was doing and I loved what he was doing. Um, so it was a great partnership. Um, I had a great time uh, inking, in, inking him on the Hulk. And I, who knows how long I would have stayed on that book, uh, but one day, uh, Jerry Ordway, I was up in New York turning some pages in, just saying hello to everybody, and uh, I was at the Marvel office, and Jerry Ordway came in and said hi, and he said, you know, why don't, why don't you do more penciling? I always liked your penciling. And I said, I don't, I don't know, I'm having a good time inking Dale here on the Hulk. <laughs> And he said, well, we're looking for a new penciler on, on Superman. Would you be interested in, in uh, maybe drawing some Superman? I said, well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, again, Superman was the main comic I read as a kid. Uh, so to, to think about actually drawing him for my job, uh, that was something. Um, so I said, yeah. Uh, so I went over and talked to the editor at, at DC, and they ended up hiring me over there. So I had to quit. Inking Dale on the Hulk. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to reiterate what Steve was saying, the reason why we love those Hulk too is like the Hulk was massive. That's how me and Steve love the Hulk. And you he filled the entire panel. Like you would like, right, Steve? Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful Hulk. Before I give yeah, it to Niall, I do have to ask you this. Yeah. Now, I know this is going to be a big jump in your career because first you're this guy that just kind of like, you know, you're taking a chance and then, you know, you, you, you're like ice skating through the, the Marvel lot, like your career and getting things and things are coming to you. But I have to ask you starting a big jump forward in your uh, career, you see these characters you took a chance on where dad and mom encouraged you, your, your, your family, you were that artist, and now you see these characters on the big screen. I have to ask you, like, like how how when you're sitting there and looking at that, like, how does that make Bob McCloud feel? Like, like little, how's little Bobby thinking? And like, <laughs> like, what does your parents think? Or do you, are, they, are you like, or how are you feeling? Like, do you wish they were there? I just just tell me that whole thing. I have to know. Well, unfortunately, my parents had passed by that time. Right, um, right. I still I have two sisters, and um, I have a family, a wife, and and children. And um, at the time in 1982, when we were signing our contracts for the New Mutants, we, there's a little clause in there: if we ever make a movie, the New Mutants, you get a certain amount of money, and la la la. And we laughed about it. We, yeah, right. They're going to make a movie, The New Mutants. It was a joke. You know, <laughs> we, we never dreamed that they'd actually make a movie of The New Mutants. Uh, so then when this rumor started that there was going to be a New Mutants movie um, by Fox uh, and uh, they were they were going to pay me what was in my contract from 1982, <laughs> which in 1982 sounded like a good chunk of money. But when the movie came out in the 2000s, it was, it was you know, very little. But that's what they, like, here's your contract. This is what you get. So I got a lawyer and started having negotiations with uh, Marvel and, and trying to uh, get some more money out of them. Um, so in the beginning, it was just, um, well, wait a minute. If they're actually going to do a movie, you know, I, I, sh I should get more money than this. Um, and Chris had his own lawyer and wouldn't tell me what, how much he was getting. I had heard what, you know, Jim Starlin had made on his movie and all the, all these different artists that had movies made of their characters and how much money they made. Um, so, you know, I, I thought, you know, I should get some money out of it. Um, but as far as the movie went, I was thinking um, a horror movie. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, not what I would have done. <laughs> you know, the mass public doesn't know who the new mutants are. Shouldn't we be doing like an or origin story of them? Ra I mean, it's interesting to do horror. Uh, I liked the, the uh, Demon Bear saga storyline. Uh, Bill Sienkiewicz was on the book at that time. Um, I'm a fan of Bill's art, um, you know, could be interesting. Uh, maybe it'll bring some new fans in that 
wouldn't necessarily go to a superhero movie, but they'll go to a horror movie. Um, so maybe it's a good marketing thing to do a horror movie. I just hope they do it well. And there was, you know, supposedly the director wanted to do a trilogy. Um, so this was going to be one kind of movie. Then he was going to do two more New Mutants movies of different types. I don't remember if they were both going to be horror or what, but different types of movies. So I said, well, they, at least they've got big plans. Could be great. Not what I would have done or how I would have done it. Um, and then, you know, COVID came along and nobody could even go to the movies. And um, there was all this back and forth with, was the movie going to come out? Was it going to get shelved and never seen? You know, was uh, it was just a mess. They kept delaying it. I think it got, to, the, the premiere got delayed twice. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, finally... It came out, but I, I wasn't ready to go back to the theater. Uh, I think it was maybe the second movie shown uh, after COVID came along uh, where people would go to a movie to go to the theater to see a movie. I wasn't ready to go into a theater yet, so I didn't go see it. Um, I ended up, someone gave me a bootleg copy of it. So I, I finally saw it on my TV. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, so I'm looking at it and um, I'm thinking, well, that's not how rain's supposed to look. You know, I, I love Maisie Williams. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched Game of Thrones, love Maisie Williams. Thought, great, but she's supposed to be a ginger. You know, she's supposed to have light red hair and, and freckles. Mm -hmm. She's not supposed to look like Maisie Williams looked in the movie. Um, and then Cannonball, oh, wait a minute. Cannonball's supposed to be tall and gawky okay, you know, I like the guy from the Stranger Things, uh, you know, what, what Charlie Heaton, good actor, he, I'm fine, oh, okay, but he's supposed to have blonde hair, um, and then Cannonball, really? Cannonball is supposed to be a short guy, dark skin, what is this? Um, and then uh, Danny Moonstar, um, at least they got a Native American actress, but I'm saying, well, Fine, she looks great, but couldn't they have just given her some braids the way I always drew her? <laughs> Would that yeah. kill her? <laughs> yeah. And then um, Magic, who I had nothing to do with, she was created later after I left the series. Magic looked spot on the way she does in the comics. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like they were deliberately snubbing me. And so anyway, so then I'm watching the movie. It's it's fine. Not a bad movie, not a great movie, but it's it's fine. It's it's entertaining. Gets to the end. I know what you're gonna say. And the credits have my name spelled wrong. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. I was gonna ask you that. That yeah. Did they end up fixing it though, Bob? Pardon? Did they end up fixing that though? Did you cut did you for the for the release when they released it to uh digital, you know, when it when it went cable and, and whatever they fixed it yeah okay okay so i found out later the movie production people aren't responsible for credits that's a whole separate business of people that put the credits on movies and so it, it wasn't the director or anybody making the movie's fault it was this other company's fault that my name was spelled wrong and i'm certainly not the first person whose name has been spelled wrong in credits before many many much bigger people than me have had their names spelled wrong in a movie before. And I also found out they don't even have to give us credit in a movie. They could um, totally ignore who the comic creators were if they want to. There's, there's no legal reason they have to put our names on a movie. Um, but then when they, if they're going to, and then when they did, they just said uh, something like, Special thanks to Chris Claremont, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, and Bob McLeod. Well, what does that mean? We we brought the crew lunch. You know, what does special thanks mean? Yeah. <laughs> why, why couldn't they just say, you know, cr characters created by Chris Claremont and Bob McLeod? I mean, if they're going to give us credit, why not give us our proper credit? I always talk to Chris about that too. And he always made the funny joke to me. And he said like, yeah, they gave us credit, but we were after the grips. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was hilarious. Go ahead, Niall. Go ahead. Well, well, I, as these gentlemen know, I'm a DC guy. 
and yeah. uh you, you started getting segueing into it you know uh you know with orway talking to you about drawing superman so i would love to hear about your time uh, over at dc i know you worked on some superman titles uh and even reunited with louis simonson on simonson on some stuff there so if you could dive into a little bit of that i definitely appreciate that yeah so i i started on superman uh inking a job by Kerry gamble first then they had uh I think an annual or something that I had a penciling job on <clears throat> that I penciled and inked. Um, so then they offered me action comics to pencil every month. Uh, but uh, Brett Breeding was already inker there and uh, he was there first and wanted me to do breakdowns. And I really, you know, I started my career as an inker. I, I I have a certain way I, I like the art to look, the finished art. My whole uh, interest in drawing comics is not the storytelling. I try to do good storytelling and it's important to me, but I don't want to just do storytelling uh, the way a lot of other pencilers are happy to do. Uh, Ron Friends loves doing storytelling. Jerry Ordway, as great an artist as he is, doesn't want to just do commissions and, and pinups. He likes doing the storytelling in comics. To me, it was more about the finished art. Um, and the storytelling is just part of leading up to the finished art. But okay, so I'll do breakdown. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm working on Superman. Great. I was excited. Um, so I, I was I was doing breakdowns um, and Brett Breeding, great inker. Um, but Brett and the editors and, and the other guys working on Superman and I all felt that Brett and I weren't the best fit. There was something about my penciling style that wasn't quite meshing the way we thought it should with Brett's work. Um, so uh, we took Brett off the book. I inked a couple issues myself. Um, and then they asked me who I would like to have as an inker. And once again, you know, you all the inkers you want are busy on other books. Um, but I saw I saw this guy who had been inking, um, I think Lobo, uh, Denny Rodier, and I liked the way he was inking uh, the, the Lobo stuff over. Um, oh, what's that artist uh, that was doing Lobo? Um, whatever his name is. Um, I liked I liked his his work. Uh, I said, well, how about this guy, Denny Rodier? And so they got Denny on and um, Denny started doing uh, exactly what he, he was trying to be so faithful to my pencils. But again, I was doing breakdown. I wasn't doing finished pencils. And so Denny was doing things that I wasn't really happy with. You know, really, my whole career. The reason I left my penciling series is because I wanted to ink myself. It wasn't looking really the way I wanted it to look. Um, and so Denny was inking a few issues and, you know, doing a good job. He's a good, he's a good inker, but it just wasn't the way I would have inked it. Um, I started tightening up the pencils, um, trying to show him exactly what I wanted. And he was trying to give me exactly what I wanted. Um, but he's him and not me. And, you know, every artist has their own style and we're all individuals and it, you can mimic somebody's style, but you're not them. You know, it's, it's, it's different. It comes up looking different. Um, and I just, you know, childishly or whatever, I wanted to ink my own stuff. You know, I wanted to ink my own work, make it look the way I wanted it to look. So I ended up quitting Superman same reason I left the New Mutants. You know, I just, I wanted to ink my own pencils. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's funny. Like uh, you being on your, uh, you, like your dream projects, like you're doing this stuff and it's like, <laughs> you, you know, and it's kind of like, it, that, that's got to be frustrating because here you are doing those dream projects and you're looking at it and it's just like, it's just grit in your teeth. And it's, yeah, that, that's got to be hard, especially, you know, when you, when you see that, because being an artist, you have that thing in your head and you're not seeing it on the paper and all that yeah, stuff. I mean, and, and again, some artists are very happy just doing penciling and with an inker. Um, 
sometimes they get a good inker, sometimes they don't, but they're happy doing the penciling. And that, that just wasn't me. I penciled Star Wars for a little while uh, with my favorite inker, Tom Palmer, inking me. Oh, and yeah. I was doing, again, Tom Palmer was there first. He wanted me to do breakdowns. So I was doing breakdowns. And I was fascinated to see what my favorite inker, Tom Palmer, would do with my pencils as opposed to what I would have done with them. And he did some genius stuff. You know, he did some really good right. stuff. Anytime I would do a little bit more than breakdowns and suggest some lighting or something, he would do something different. <laughs> and it was almost funny because anytime I tried to do anything more than breakdowns, he wouldn't do it. He would do something else. And <laughs> it was good. You know, Tom Palmer is great. He's my favorite, but it wasn't the way I wanted it to look. You know, yeah. I wanted to eat myself. Uh, so I left Star Wars after about six issues. Oh, poor Bobby. Look at Bobby. You know, <laughs> it kind of no. reminds it kind of reminds me though, like, cause like yourself, you know, my father was in construction and everything and, you know, always, uh, you know, encouraged my art and my stuff and things like that. But I kind of like the way you're talking, I kind of have like that construction mentality, right? Like you've got, you, like, let's talk carpenters, right? You've got, you know, your framers, rough carpenters, you got your finished carpenters, things like that. So, you know, if, if a finished carpenter you know, kind of goes back to, let's say the framing stage and he's watching a, a new finish carpenter come in and it's like ah, he's not doing that right <laughs> like i have to imagine there has to be a conflict uh, not a conflict but you know there may be a little bit of a conflict yeah maybe that's the right word of just seeing someone else doing the finish work because i mean with inking you know you are rendering you're the fine lines you're really bringing those pencils to life and i really think inkers make the artist and uh and nowadays too with technology and the way they color now i mean wow it's phenomenal what the color springs to the table but it, it it must be hard though to because you want a pencil, but inking is such a fine craft in itself. I mean, it's truly admirable. It, was that really kind of like like a big issue? Is just that your final vision just couldn't come. It just it just wasn't melding together. Yeah, you know, I don't think fans really understand uh, the whole pencil or inker thing. When you're working with a different artist uh, trying to do a piece of art. You've got these two egos and these two different uh, ways of doing things that they've learned what they know. And we don't all learn everything the same uh, way. We don't uh, learn the same things at the same time or end up in the same place. And so your inker knows what he knows. The penciler knows what he knows. And then they've got to work together and try to you know, create this thing that both of them are going to be happy with. That's, that's really difficult to accomplish. Um, so, you know, Joe Rubenstein's a friend of mine. When he inks, his philosophy is he wants to be as faithful to the penciler as he can be because um, uh, he wants to make the penciler happy. And uh, he's, he's kind of subservient in that way to the penciler, whereas when I was inking other artists, I wasn't as concerned as making the penciler happy as I was in taking what the penciler had given me and trying to just make the best art I could make. And assuming that if I made the best art I could make, the penciler would like it. And if he didn't like it, you know, fire me and get a different inker. I, I don't know. I was That was okay with me. But so many pencilers that I inked uh, didn't maybe know his anat anatomy as well as I did, or they didn't know how to render their stuff as well as, as I thought I did. And um, so I, I, I didn't want to just be tracing stuff that I knew I could do better. So I would change things when I inked not with out of disrespect to the penciler, but just trying to, to kind of help them, bring out the best of their work, try to make them look the best they could look, but also put my polish on it uh, so that I'm not just a machine, you know, doing the physical labor of putting ink over their pencils. Um, you know, I always, I always liked the way that Gene Colan and Tom Palmer made a great team even though tom palmer's inking was nothing like the way gene would ink himself yeah yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. it was it was very different gene was a brush inker 
Palmer was mainly a pen inker and um, it was a magnificent art when they were meshed together, you know, Joe Sennett and, and uh, Jack Kirby um, just had a, a way of working together, very different from the way Jack Kirby would ink himself. So, you know, there's mm -hmm. some teams really meshed well and some didn't. And um, I never really found an inker, even though I had the top inkers, I had Tom Palmer, I had Joe Rubenstein, I, I had uh, Brett Breeding, uh, Denny Rodi, I, I had all these guys inking my pencils, but it just wasn't meshing the way I wanted it to mesh, you know. No. Okay, we're going to be winding down. Steve, uh, probably want to do some last questions for uh, Mr. Bo, Mr. McLeod? Yeah. Uh, but this, and again, this last little segment has been fascinating because yeah, absolutely. John Basema also had the same problem where he would, you know, he would gripe apparently to Mr. Roy Thomas sometimes about way, hey, well, why, why can't I ink my own stuff? Um, and then he would do two issues in a row and he would be exhausted. It's, I mean, back in those days, of course you yeah. were on this again, you, uh, it was a machine. And, you know, I think if you were, had been advanced into the modern era where you don't have to have these tight schedules, I mean, a, a book can be late. You could have had the room, to say, okay, look, I'm not going to get 12 books out a year, but I'm going to get six. And these six are going to be the best damn books you've ever seen in your life. Okay. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people have done in this modern era. And, you know, that's why it's impossible. And I, it drives me nuts when people try to compare, you know, modern artists that do six books in nine years. And they say, well, look how magnificent he is. And then it's like, well, you do realize this guy did 12 issues in one year. In actual fact, uh, this guy did 50 issues in one year. Okay, you can't compare that. And I think, obviously, from what you're explaining here, you're a perfectionist working in an industry that's uh, like a machine and cogs. It's turning, and they're like, uh, are you done yet? And you're like, well, hold on a second. I just want to make sure. Give me the work. Give me it. The prince is screaming on the phone. So, again, you're yeah, but Steve. Being a perfectionist in an industry that didn't allow it at the time. Um, yeah, Steve, you know how it ended up that way, though, with the modern guys? My generation of artists uh, were aging out, and the, and the editors wanted to bring in these young guys. Um, the young guys didn't understand storytelling the way the predecessors did. So they could do flashy drawings, but they didn't know how to tell a story. Absolutely. Not only that, not only that all of their flashy drawings took a long time to be flashy um so they couldn't meet a deadline and so the editors had all these young new hot artists that couldn't meet a deadline so what could they do they had to start making three issue miniseries instead of monthly titles and um so it's the industry the whole industry has changed now but during my heyday we had these monthly titles that you had to do you know, a certain number of pages every month in order to get a paycheck. And guys like John Buscema, you know, I ain't John on, on Conan. Um, and he's my favorite guy to ink. It was, I had a great time inking him on Conan. But, and I might've left Conan to ink Dale on, on the Hulk. I don't remember. But anyway, um, John was cranking out these five pages a day because you get a page rate and the more pages you do, the more money you make. And if he inked himself, he couldn't ink as quickly as he could lay out these pages. So he would make less money and it was more tedious and, uh, you know, it was more satisfying artistically, but, you know, he's got bills to pay. He's raising a family, you know, and everybody wants him to draw more than they want him to ink. Yes. And it, it was kind of the same way with me. They wanted me to ink more than they wanted me to draw. And I could make more money inking, than I could penciling because I had to think more when I was penciling. Inking, it's all there and I know what to do. But with penciling, should I have a close up here? Should I have his arm up here or down here? You know, there's all this thinking um, that slows you down. Um, you know, it's it's just a different business today than it was then. But I think, Steve, Steve, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, 
a reason why those comics from your generation that me and Steve gravitate to and we can't stop talking is is the storytelling. Of course, the great I think the greatest art, all that stuff, but the storytelling was so powerful, so more meaningful, and so sub like subconsciously like like a movie that there's just something about those comics that are so immortalized. Like I mean, they they have so much like reread factor. Like you can oh me yeah. and Steve can be exactly. doing a hundred things. We see that one issue we saw a million times. We'll still pick it up. We'll still look <laughs> through it just for the hell of it. And we know every little dot, every little whatever little period in that entire comic. But you, there's something so strong about that. There is, you know, call me biased, but you just don't get that anymore. It's just something about that, that classic storytelling that even though you guys were under pressure too, like making deadlines, it's just that I think comics were like Stan and Jack and Roy and all those other guys want, uh, you know, you got to tell a good story. That's the thing. It's not just a, a great, uh, uh, you know, just a panel of just this big shot with about 50 word balloons and you got, you, you're looking at it and you, you feel like, this thing hits the track. I can't take that. I, I just can't. But 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 I just want you to know that that that, that you Steve, you said that perfectly. That just like and, and and Bob, you you're making sense to my brain, you know. And that was all subconscious to me, even when I was an uneducated reader. And you look at that, it just the storytelling was so strong that you really can see it now, now that I'm more educated. And I'm just I want to thank you with that too. And so Niall, you want to have any last words for Mr. McLeod? Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank you, Bob, for coming on. I, again, like I said, I've been wanting to get you on the network for a while now, and I really appreciate the time spending with you listening to your stories and chatting. And uh, lastly, though, um, you know, I know you're, you know, you're, you're out of comics now. Uh, so so what do you do uh, now to preoccupy your time? Are you working on other ventures, doing new things? What's what's the, the day in the life of Bob now? <laughs> Today, I was building a closet off of our deck. We added a deck onto our home. <laughs> and I, I wanted to create this closet to put our couch uh, furniture in so it doesn't get rained on. So I was doing manual labor today. <laughs> but my average day um, <clears throat> this year, really just trying to do some painting. Um, you you mentioned the painting I did of Pat Broderick a little earlier. Um, I'm, I'm just doing painting for my own enjoyment. Um, I want to do some landscapes, uh, some portraits, some maybe still life or something. I, I don't know. Um, Non-comics work, because I've been doing comics for 45 years and I love comics, but um, I want to try something else. You know, as an artist, you don't want to just do the same thing that you've been doing your whole life. You want to keep growing as an artist and, and learning new stuff and doing new things. And so uh, I, I never have had much chance to do painting. So I want to try, and I don't know, I, you know, I'm not trying to be a great painter. I just want to have fun with it and, and do some paintings just, just for my own enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and lastly, Bob, I have to ask you, since you're such a perfectionist and you always had these problems with this comic, what was that one comic? Because I want to see if I have it in the collection or I'm going to probably pick that up. But what was the one comic that you did that you were so, you were like, that's what I'm looking for. That's what was in my head. That's what I see on the paper. What was that? If you can pick that one comic that truly like, it might be an obscure one, but it just really was, that's what I wanted to always put on paper. What would it be? Uh, I would say Teen Hulk. No, just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome good good yeah actually i mean really uh some of the teen hulk stuff that's what i wanted wow. my art to be but as far as superhero stuff goes um and i am not a fan particularly of the character venom but i did a venom mini series uh venom the enemy within with bruce jones doing yeah. the writing mm. and i penciled and inked it and I said, uh, I've got this character, Venom. I'm, I'm going to try to knock it out of the park. I'm going to try to do my absolute best work. And it came along at a period when I felt I was capable of doing my best work. I had a great brush. And I was 
really happy with the way the brush was working. And um, I, so I did mostly brush inking on that job. And I, I think the mini series I did of, of Venom uh, is really some of my best work. Um, and then right after that, I, I did a mini series of Spider-Man um, uh, that I penciled and inked and Steve Grant wrote with Spider-Man and the Punisher. Um, I think those two are some of my best work. Wow, that's good to know. And and this is good to hear because so many times you hear people just collecting a paycheck and you know, oh yeah, I just banged it out and all that. But hearing it from your perspective, this was a, a great education for all of us. And I can tell you that it's, it really opened up like some windows in my head, but I love to hear the fact that how much it meant to you each and every, you know, like comic and how it was hurting you on some things. And like, it, you know, that that's good to hear because it showed that you're a true artist, an artist artist that you like to see that. Unfortunately for like a guy like Jack Kirby, he would just pound it out. He wouldn't even see it. You know, they would do it and you looked at this stuff and it's like, you studied your stuff and you're like, Oh, this could be better. I, I just, I just, I like, I like hearing that. And it just shows that, uh, you know, you really cared about your work and stuff and what you were putting out there. And so other people are seeing some genius work, but you're not, sometimes you're not seeing that. And that's, I think that's <laughs> awesome. I think that's thank great. And once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. It's been a pleasure. And I'm glad that I, sometimes I saw some, I see you sometimes you're on the, you do the con scene. Do you just do the con yeah. stuff in, in Florida or do you travel? No, I travel all over the world. I, I do a lot of, last year I did like over a dozen conventions. This year Good. I'm doing more like six. I'm really trying to cut back so that I have more time for painting. Um, so I'm still doing conventions and I'm doing sketches at cons, um, whatever the fans want me to draw at a convention. But when I'm not at a convention, I'm trying to just do what I want to do. Right. Good for you. Once again, Bob, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. I know Steve and Niall, we're, we're honored to have you here. And it's great. Been Like I said, it's been an education. So, uh, Steve, let's get us out of here with Mighty Mystic Milner. Thank you so much. Boom. Boom. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.